Well, good morning, folks. I'm very pleased and privileged to be able to deliver the Founders Day Address. This is the first time, and I'm grateful to Dr. Dockery for the privilege and the opportunity. My uh, talk is entitled, Trinity's Second Founding, A Heritage for Today. All around Trinity's campus this year, we see banners bearing the alliterative couplet, heritage and hope, the motto of this new era under Dr. Dockery. I'm all for it. I believe our hope for institutional health and service today lies in a continued commitment to our heritage, particularly as defined in what I will call Trinity's second founding. Trinity's mission, as it was revitalized about a half century ago, continues to animate our efforts today and should do so, I contend, with renewed vigor. I'd like to take us back to that formative time when Trinity Bible College and Seminary became Trinity College and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, a time when these schools made a deliberate choice to wed faith and learning in dynamic relationship for the service of Christ and the world, adopting the vision of the new evangelical movement that emerged in post-war America. That moment in God's providence ushered in a period of unprecedented growth for Trinity. Historical conditions have changed radically, but this Trinity distinctive Faithful, fearless learning, together with heartfelt commitment to the Lord and his word, remains central to our calling. Our institutional past is a complicated one, with origins in three Scandinavian immigrant communities, Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish, interacting with American revivalism and fundamentalism. In the early days, we partnered briefly with Moody Bible Institute and Wheaton College. That early heritage is a mixture of pietism and revivalism, strongly emphasizing the importance of the heart. Our institutional forebears experienced the power of God in the gospel, tasting God's mercy and goodness. They wanted to share it with unbelievers and to cultivate in believers a life of devotion and commitment. These heart roots are our earliest ones. They go back the farthest and down the deepest. We here at Trinity never want to lose our first love, our faithful response with joy, humility, and wonder at the grace of God freely given to us in Jesus Christ. We owe everything to him, and we are determined never to forget it. Accordingly, Trinity Seminary and Bible College focused on the training of pastors and other Christian workers in the early days. They were very small institutions serving a small denominational constituency. But then there came a dramatic shift to wider service that we might characterize as a second founding. Not a revolution wiping out the old, but a kind of reconstitution, enlarging the vision of both schools and creating a distinctive purpose that persists to this day. That happened, as I said, a little more than half a century ago, and it's that moment in time that I want to open up to us today. Let's turn our eyes back to the America of the 1950s. Images that may come to mind include President Eisenhower playing golf, the building of the interstate highway system, soda fountains, saddle shoes, and screaming teenagers watching Elvis gyrate on the Ed Sullivan Show, enormous pastel-colored gas-guzzling cars with tail fins and chrome. These were the years of a booming post-war economy, booming suburbs, and the baby boom, a lot of booming as the country basked in post-war prosperity and superpower status. But these were also the years that saw the Cold War settle in for the long haul. Communist takeovers abroad and fears of communist plots at home, not to mention fears of nuclear destruction. Our rivalry with the atheistic Soviet Union was one factor encouraging a revival of church-going 
and spiritual interest in 1950s America. Add to that mix the beginnings of the civil rights movement, exposing the hypocrisy and failures of our ostensibly model society, and you can see why the revolutionary changes of the 1960s soon followed. This dynamic post-war America was the setup for the second founding of both Trinity institutions. Trinity Bible College had begun as a two-year Bible institute, serving primarily to prepare free church young men for entry into the seminary, and secondarily to give men and women a fast track to other Christian service. Only three majors were offered, Bible, missions, and Christian education. As late as 1949, Trinity's president, C.R. Ludwigson, wrote, quote, Is the free church going to sponsor a liberal arts college? The answer is no, in capital letters. Our plan is to make our school a Bible college, capital letters again, that will be a glory to our Lord and to our free church testimony. A mere four years later, however, the catalog described a four-year curriculum with a general education component, quote, designed to introduce the student to the broad fields of human knowledge, to acquaint him with some of the problems and responsibilities facing him as a Christian, and to help him begin to develop such desirable attitudes as love for truth, respect for evidence, discrimination, appreciation, taste, and tolerance, unquote. Clearly, these were cardinal goals of a liberal arts education. What brought about this change? The answer lies largely in post-war demographics. By the mid-50s, the baby boom was in full swing with an attendant need for qualified teachers. Trinity Bible College accordingly added an elementary education major and a solid gen ed program was needed in order to gain state certification. In addition, the Evangelical Free Church membership by the 1950s was joining other ethnic churches in moving to the American middle class mainstream, moving beyond working class unconcern for higher cultural attainments. It wasn't just that these descendants of immigrants wanted mere status markers. The catalog language suggests cordial belief in the value of liberal education to fit the Christian for responsible participation in the public square. Add to that the pragmatic reality of a burgeoning demand for teachers and the awareness that teachers shape the rising generation, and the demographic trends dovetailed nicely with broadly Christian principles. When the Roman Catholic Church opened its African mission schools to Protestant teachers, an overtly evangelistic purpose furthered the appeal of an education program at the college. Soon, Trinity added a program to train high school teachers, and with it, four new majors to support subject specialization, English, social science, French, and Spanish. President Norton's report to the EFCA annual conference in 1958 announced, there has been a concerted effort to make the Lord Jesus Christ relevant and meaningful in all courses offered, an education for life. By 1960, the school was no longer Trinity Bible College, but simply Trinity College. The change meant not loss of belief in the Bible, but a broadening of the mission of the college to address the intersection of faith and learning across the disciplines. And the change, together with baby boomers entering their college years, brought substantial growth. 270 students in 1959, 403 by 1967, peaking at 914 in 1979. At the same time that these rather prosaic changes in American society and culture were in God's providence providing conditions for the growth of Trinity College, a seismic shift in the religious landscape was beginning, the resurgence of evangelicalism. Once dominant in American economic, sorry, once dominant in American academic and political culture, evangelical Christianity had suffered a tremendous loss of prominence in the early 1900s. 
Theological liberals, fearing that historic Christianity was unscientific and out of step with the modern world, attempted to salvage what they deemed the enduring spirit of Christianity by adjusting its doctrines to modern conditions. Leave behind the old credulous beliefs in miracles, angels and demons, bloody atonement and human inability, they said. Embrace the great commandment to love God and neighbor. Imitate the sense of dependence on a higher power that Jesus, the man, exemplified. Wasn't that what all great religions boiled down to? Fundamentalists, rightly seeing the liberal salvage operation as a betrayal of God's word and of the doctrines of grace, fought against it and lost. Liberal theology dominated most mainline seminaries. The universities adopted a nominal liberal Christianity and relegated it to their chapels, leaving the pursuit of knowledge to a methodological naturalism. Bible believers either endured as best they could as a quiet minority within the major denominations or split, forming small separate bodies defined too often by what they opposed. Even in denominations that hadn't suffered the fundamentalist modernist controversies themselves, the Southern Baptists, ethnic conservatives, including Lutherans, Dutch Reformed, and our own EFCA, as well as Pentecostal churches, gospel believers all around felt themselves a beleaguered, faithful remnant. But then, in the words of David Wells and John Woodbridge, after an era of painful eclipse, and emerging under the high noon of secularism. A new evangelical movement arose, particularly notable because the demise of evangelical Protestantism, both in the popular imagination and the academic mind, had appeared so complete. This new evangelicalism brought with it a new sense of future promise for the role of Christianity in society and thought, something the fundamentalists had lost and a signal manifesto of this new evangelical attitude was the work of a man whose name you all know, Carl F.H. Henry. If you don't know that name, look at the west side of the library. The name is there, partly hidden behind a pine tree. Henry was nearing the completion of his PhD in philosophy at Boston University, sorry, Boston College, in the years right after World War II having previously worked in journalism, when he published two epical books, Remaking the American Mind, 1946, and The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism, 1947. These issued a clarion call for Bible-believing Christians to recognize the new opportunities God was giving them to provide hope and answers for a frightened and dispirited post-war world. You might think the triumph of the Allies over Hitler, Mussolini, and the Japanese militarists would confirm people's faith in good prevailing over evil. But the post-war world saw a great deal of hand-wringing about what humanity had shown itself capable of, both in the concentration camps and at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If World War I disabused Europeans of their faith in the inevitable progress and inherent goodness of humanity, World War II did it for Americans. The liberal theology seemed woefully insufficient. Henry saw a golden opportunity for evangelicals if they would shed the mentality of cultural withdrawal Communism, fascism, two world wars, and the atomic bomb might not be signaling the immediate end of the world right then and the return of Christ. Henry urged his fellow premillennialists, he was a premillennialist too, to stop looking for signs of the end and get back to serving in Christ's name until the end. While the Lord tarries, Henry wrote, the gospel is still relevant to every problem that vexes the two billion inhabitants of an apprehensive globe. This call still stirs our efforts at Trinity today in both the Divinity School and the college, and for that matter, in the graduate school and the law school. We are determined to stand by the Bible and the gospel, evangelizing the lost, nurturing believers, and engaging the culture. 
These things are not in opposition to each other. Liberals substituted a social gospel in place of traditional evangelism. Many fundamentalists dismissed structural social concern as a hallmark of liberalism and a useless effort in view of the Lord's soon return. But Henry urged that the gospel should prompt us to specific action against the wrongs of the world. Wrongs like, and now I'm quoting him, aggressive warfare, racial hatred and intolerance, exploitation of labor or management, and political naturalism. We can talk about the particular applications. The point is, Jesus Christ has redeemed us not just for the sweet by and by, but to serve in this world in the meantime. The new evangelical movement built up a head of steam in the late 1950s. While Trinity College was morphing from a Bible institute into a liberal arts college, Carl Henry and a phenomenally successful evangelist named Billy Graham steered the new evangelical movement toward an identity that this small ethnic denomination, the Evangelical Free Church of America, decided in the early 1960s to adopt for its own institutions of learning. Our identity at TIU owes much to the effort to the effects of Billy Graham's early ministry. A fiery Southern Baptist revivalist preacher, Graham rocketed to fame in the early 1950s, attracting huge crowds to his gospel crusades and enjoying the hospitality of presidents from Eisenhower onwards. Photographs of Graham with Ike at the White House were potent markers of the reemergence of fundamental Christianity into the public sphere. Graham shared Henry's vision of a respectable and culturally relevant presence for the old-time gospel. In 1953, he began thinking of starting a new Christian magazine, evangelical and scholarly in tone, to, quote, plant the theological flag in the middle of the road, taking a conservative theological position, but a definite liberal approach to social problems, unquote. The publication would give, would give evangelicals in the mainline churches a voice and give the new evangelical movement recognition and respectability in the wider culture. Christianity Today, as the new magazine was eventually called, would serve as a second distinctly evangelical voice alongside the well-established and liberal Christian century. The first editor of this new magazine, Carl F.H. Henry. In 1956, Christianity Today became a reality. With generous financial backing from J. Howard Pugh, the first 10 issues of CT were sent free of charge to every pastor in the United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and foreign missionaries. In just four years, its circulation matched that of the Christian century. CT uh, succeeded better at its aim to gain respectability and a voice than at its aim to take a liberal approach to social problems, especially the problem of race. Its early years were precisely those of the early civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. Graham's socially conservative father-in-law, L. Nelson Bell, exercised final control over the magazine's content so that little excuse me, so that in the words of Grant Wacker, in his brand new uh, biography, by the way, of, of Graham, America's pastor, uh, in the words of Grant Wacker, CT dragged its feet on civil rights till the 1970s. Even so, Wacker notes, a steady stream of surprisingly progressive editorial and news pieces appeared, constituting what he calls a minority view within the magazine. Presumably these Progressive editorial pieces were the work of the editor, Carl Henry. Progress on race within the neo-evangelical movement was more substantial in Graham's own work. In 1956, he wrote articles that appeared in Life and Ebony magazines expressly declaring racism a sin and decrying the separation of the races in the churches. Then, at the 1907 Madison Square Garden Crusade in Midtown Manhattan, Graham made two decisions that significantly shaped the evangelical identity that Trinity would soon adopt. 
The first had to do with the race question. At Graham's invitation, Martin Luther King Jr. offered the prayer of invocation at Madison Square Garden on July 18th. And Graham praised King for leading what he called a great social revolution. He also began a regular practice of featuring African-American vocal artists on the platform. It was that summer at Madison Square Garden that Ethel Waters and Mahalia Jackson sang for the first time at a Billy Graham crusade. And at the advice of African-American pastor Howard Jones, Graham followed up the crusade with meetings in Harlem and Brooklyn. At the latter place, Graham told his mostly black audience, some people are not going to get to heaven because they will not feel at home. Color is meaningless in the sight of God. In all these ways, Graham signaled, a very, signaled very publicly his support for the civil rights movement. By 1964, two of Graham's nine associate evangelists were black, a larger proportion than in the general population. The new evangelical movement would have a long way to go on the race question, and the road had many twists and turns, including Graham's later, more difficult relationship with King. But here was a start. Racial progress was now a stated goal of the new evangelicalism, one that Kenneth Conser would explicitly take up, again with limited results, when he launched TEDS on its present course. The other, other pivotal decision Graham made in New York City in 1957 was to work with all churches that wanted to join in his crusade, including mainline liberal and Roman Catholic ones. People who made decisions for Christ at the crusade would be paired with churches of their own denomination, if they had one, for follow-up. This caused a permanent rift between Graham and hardline fundamentalists like Bob Jones Sr., Thereafter, the terms fundamentalist and evangelical designated two different things. Fundamentalists separated from perceived apostates and from believers who themselves would not separate. Evangelicals worked with other believers and left the question of separation to each person's conscience. Fundamentalists believed that Graham and his ilk had sacrificed truth on the altar of influence. Evangelicals committed themselves to working in a broad coalition of Christians of various persuasions for the sake of gospel witness and cultural influence. Those involved in Trinity's second founding deliberately chose the evangelical name and a clear stand on the authority of the scriptures. Six years after the Madison Square Garden Crusade, in August 1963, a small news item appeared in the back pages of Christianity Today under the heading, Conser Smith to Trinity. The article stated, and I quote, to serve a wider constituency, the Evangelical Free Church of America last week chose Dr. Kenneth S. Conser as dean of its Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, renamed from Trinity Theological Seminary. Approved immediate construction of married students' dormitories on its new 79-acre campus in Bannockburn, Illinois, and announced plans for major faculty enlargement. Dr. William M. Smith, formerly of Fuller Seminary, becomes professor of English Bible. President H. Wilbert Norton summarizes the seminary's theological thrust as firmly oriented to the historic Christian fundamentals with a strong orientation to the inerrancy of the scriptures, unquote. Clear signals were given in this brief notice. On the one hand, the enlarged faculty would serve a broader constituency, calling their institution not a seminary, but a divinity school. This meant not only that TEDS would attract students from outside the free church, but also that its purpose would reach beyond pastoral training. Like the divinity schools at Harvard and Yale, it would also train academics to shape current theological discourse. On the other hand, this vision of intellectual engagement would remain true to the old-time gospel and the authority of the Bible. The school would remain the EFCA seminary, but Carl Henry's intentions for Christianity today would apply equally well to TEDS, to provide an orthodox center to a broad evangelical coalition. 
Central to this second founding was the new dean, Kenneth Conser. President Norton, who was present at Dr. Dockery's inauguration in October, and who turns 100 this Saturday, was determined to bring Conser to Trinity from Wheaton to provide leadership for the upgrading of the school. The story is beautifully told in Scott Manich's booklet issued last year to commemorate the TED's 50th anniversary. Conser felt that, quote, most seminaries in the United States had either abandoned their evangelical commitments or were lacking the intellectual and spiritual resources needed to respond to the challenges of the secular university and culture with a coherent and faithful presentation of biblical truth. President Norton and the EFCA leadership embraced Conser's vision for TEDS as, in his famous words, a love gift from the EFCA to the entire Church of Jesus Christ. In 1963-64, Conser hired three new faculty members of national standing and launched MA programs to prepare students for specialized ministries and academic careers. This began a season of unprecedented growth. TEDS became the fastest growing seminary in America, building an impressive faculty and increasing its student body from 73 in 1963 to over 400 in 1967. Think of that in four years. And over 500 by 1969. Well, since this period of second founding around 1960, Trinity College and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School have both, follow, have both followed the conviction that in Manich's words, the church must allow God's authoritative word to speak to the contemporary world and be relevant to it. The college's embrace of liberal arts resonated well with the divinity school's new identity. Both institutions moved from serving a small denominational constituency to an intentional evangelical ecumenism. Trans-denominational service rooted in the authority of the Bible and the power of the supernatural gospel of Jesus Christ. Conser said, unlike many ecumenists in our day, we really do believe our ecumenical heritage namely the abiding core of what Christians have believed down through the centuries, the historic message of sins forgiven through God's Son, our only Savior, a message that has brought each of us here to evangelize and to serve a needy world. A final reflection. Trinity's great growth years came when America was growing, the baby boomers, and evangelicalism was experiencing a renaissance Conser said back then, the word evangelical is a magic word with great appeal to a broad public. That's why he inserted it into the seminary's name. These days we face quite a different situation. Evangelicalism is turning back to the defensive or withdrawing into the private sphere, especially since the culture wars have soured many evangelicals on the idea of wielding strength for the Lord not to mention souring many public opinion shapers on the very word evangelical. Unlike the period of the second founding, ours feels like a time of deepening moral gloom, inevitable cultural decline, when believers exercise self-censorship in the face of increasing hostility to our identity and truth claims. This sounds pretty bleak, but we've been here before and God is still Lord. We need to rekindle hope by embracing afresh the best of our heritage to keep the work of intellectual and cultural engagement using persuasion rather than politics. We need that now as much as ever. With the fallout from the moral majority approach and the further transformation of our cultural and political landscape into a raw clash of power against power, we need winsome, persuasive, well-grounded argument to call partisans back to a better way, and ultimately to the truth as it is in Jesus. Now more than ever, we need a faithful, honest, rigorous life of the mind, united with and propelled by faithful life of the spirit. 
and in an increasingly interconnected globe and an increasingly diverse America, we need to work creatively and intentionally to make good on the social vision of the second founding, still only partly fulfilled. Not just challenges, but opportunities abound. Trinity College and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School scratched a real itch in their second founding years, and people came. Let's ponder how to remain faithful to our evangelical academic identity and mission while meeting the God-given situation of this, our day. Thank you.